center of mass, aka center of gravity, going to be the topic of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which will eventually cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. When we talk about the center of mass or the center of gravity, one thing to realize is that as long as we're talking about small objects, they're going to experience the same gravity throughout the object. So in the center of mass and the center of gravity will be exactly the same thing. Now, if you had some large planetary object that maybe one side of it was experiencing more or less gravity than another, this would all you know, kind of go to put. But uh, in any kind of example you're likely to see, the center of mass and center of gravity are probably going to be the same thing. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. Now, we're going to do some calculations with center of gravity or center of mass here in a little bit. And so, uh, it turns out you're most likely going to see it in one dimension, but you might also see it in two. And we've got a lovely formula for the x coordinate of the center of gravity, and the y coordinate would be a very analogous looking equation. I've put it on the study guide there. So, and if you had three dimensions, you could do one for the z coordinate, too, truth be told. So, but you're likely to see one, uh, one dimension is most common, two dimension might happen, three dimension I highly doubt you're ever going to see. So, but what if you've got some irregular object like this lovely wrench and you wanted to practically figure out the center of gravity? So just sitting at home and stuff like that. Well, it turns out there's an easy way to figure out the center of gravity for an object as long as, as, long as it's uh, light enough that you can pick it up. So you want to suspend it from two points. So, and basically, or you might just guess, right? So if, if this is the center of gravity right where I'm going to hold it, then it should not rotate if I let go. It should be perfectly balanced. Well, that's not true. So what if I hold it over at this side? Well, that's not true either. So, but there's somewhere going to be in the middle where it's going to have uh, be perfectly balanced, and by applying a force to hold it, it's just going to stay balanced. So, and if you want to find that point and pinpoint it exactly, what you can do is suspend it from two different points. And so we're going to suspend it from this point right here. So, and it turns out when you suspend it like so, right below the point where you suspend it, draw a vertical line. So, and the center of mass, it turns out, lies right along that line somewhere. That's the way it works. Now, you want to suspend it now from a second point to figure out where it intersects that first point. And so if we kind of went right down, it's somewhere right around there. So if we drew the line all the way down where the two lines intersect, and so it had to lie on that vertical line, when, so we suspended it from this point, and then on this vertical line as well, and that's where they intersect, that must be the center of mass for this wrench. So once again, if I try to hold up this wrench, so with two fingers, it's just going to fall from there, it's just going to fall from there, but if I hold it right at that point, that's where it's perfectly balanced. It doesn't have a propensity to rotate in either direction. So, and that's one of the properties of center of mass. It's a point at which you can apply a force and get no rotation. All right. So done with the practical side of center of mass though, and let's deal with some problems here. So uh, how you might see this in a physics context. So first question here says, what is the center of gravity for the following two masses attached to the ends of a rod of negligible mass? So uh, oftentimes we do such a thing by having things connected by a rod of negligible mass to simplify the problem because if the rod itself has mass, it's gonna change the problem. We'll have to factor in everything that has mass. Well. In this case, somehow magically we have some super strong material that weighs almost nothing, or effectively nothing, connecting a 40 kilogram mass and a 10 kilogram mass, and we now want to find the center of gravity for the system. Well, it's a one-dimensional system, so it all lies in a straight line, and so that's going to make this just a one-dimensional center of gravity problem, but how do we solve for it? So, well, we've got a lovely formula here, but to, to use this lovely formula, you've got to have a coordinate system. We see that there's 10 meters from center to center, and you've got to set up a coordinate system. In this case, if they don't set one up for you, you have a choice. And so you can go from like zero to 10. You could do it backwards. You could go from zero on the right to 10 meters on the left. Nothing says you've got to follow, you know, the numerical system and from negative to positive or anything like that. You could go from negative five to positive five. You could go from negative 100 to negative 90. So as long as it's a, a, an overall length of 10 meters, the coordinate system is really up to you, but you can choose something that's more convenient. And the truth is, it's convenient to identify the location of one of the masses at a location of zero if you've got to do the calculation, because that's going to make the position of one of these zero, which is going to make this calculation just a little bit easier. And so that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to have a coordinate system here that starts 
at position zero on the left and goes to position 10 meters on the right. All right, if we look at our center of gravity equation here, so you just multiply the, uh, it's assuming you've got something composed of a bunch of point masses and you're gonna multiply the mass of one of the point masses by its X position. So, and then do the same thing for each additional point mass and then divide by the total mass of all the point masses in the system. That's effectively what this equation means. And so if we take a look at calculating this out in this case. So we're gonna have our first point mass in this case of 40 kilograms. So, and again, because we chose our coordinate system appropriately, it's at position zero and it's just gonna effectively drop out of the equation. So second point mass weighs 10 kilograms and it's at a position of 10 meters. So, and then we'll divide by the total mass of 40 kilograms plus 10 kilograms. So, and here we'll have 40 times zero again is zero. 10 times 10 is 100, and 100 over 40 plus 10 is 50, so 100 over 50. And we can see that our x coordinate of our center of gravity is gonna be the two meter mark. And so if we kind of set up our scale here and went two, four, six, eight. So then right at this two meter mark, that's where the center of gravity was. If you tried to balance this lovely rod on your finger right at that point, it would not rotate. And effectively by balancing it on your finger, you're applying the normal force, the contact force with your finger to it. And again, the center of mass is where you can apply a force and not have that object rotate. It would be perfectly balanced in this case. Cool, if you did it further to the right or further to the left, it's gonna wanna rotate one way, shape or form. Now a couple things to note you could have kind of predicted approximately where this was. You're like, there's way more mass uh, on the left-hand side of this uh, you know, image than on the right-hand side. And so the center of mass would definitely lie further to the left. And for sure, you definitely should have been able to predict that you know, the halfway point is the five meter point. It should definitely lie to the left of that. Now, a couple other things you could done when you've got just two point masses, and it's fairly common. So and the numbers are nice. There's actually a faster way than doing the whole plug and chug here to kind of reason this out. And one of them is what we call the lever rule. So in the lever rule kind of looks at the distance. So uh, on one side compared to the distance on the other side. And so even if you, you know, ballpark the center of mass and you're just way wrong, the math will still work out here. So, but the idea is this, if you look, we could have predicted that the center of mass was gonna lie closer to the left side than the right side because there's more mass on the left side than the right side. Well, in this case, how many times more mass is there on the left side than the right side? Well, 40 kilograms compared to 10 kilograms is four times more mass. And so the conclusion is that it should lie four times closer. The center of mass should lie four times closer to the left-hand end than the right-hand end. And so this distance-wise should be a four to one ratio, the exact opposite, four times closer to the 40 kilogram mass than to the 10 kilogram mass. And with a four to one ratio for those distances, so a lot of students make the mistake of then di dividing this 10 meter distance by four. But you gotta be careful with that. It's not gonna be divided by four. And looking at a four to one ratio, this implies that you've got five total parts to break this 10 meters up into. And 10 meters divides up into five equal parts very simply as two meters each. And so our one part over here would be the two meters and our four parts over here would be the eight meters. And so in identifying where's the center of mass, you know, sometimes you might see it written as, well, it's two meters to the right of the 40 kilogram mass, or it's eight meters to the left of the 10 kilogram mass. You know, if you're doing a multiple choice problem, they get to define kind of how they identify its location. Again, we chose a random coordinate system from zero to 10, we could have chose negative five to positive five. And the numerical answer of your center of mass would have been different but where it actually was relative to either one of the masses would have been exactly the same. Now there's one other approach you can do to look at this and it's really more relevant after we do the next lesson. So in the next lesson, we're gonna talk about the condition of rotational equilibrium. And the condition for rotational equilibrium is that the sum of the torques is gonna equal zero. So, well in this case, the sum of the torques uh, equaling zero implies that we're gonna put a fulcrum, so underneath this mass right at that center of mass location, and it's not gonna rotate, we said. So, okay, so that's where I'm gonna put a fulcrum, like my finger, let's say, let it balance, and it's not gonna rotate. And if it's not gonna rotate, well, that means the sum of the torques must equal zero. It's in rotational equilibrium. Well, we've got a weight applying a force right here. We've got a weight applying a force right here. 
And notice that both of these, the weight is straight down and is perpendicular to the horizontal rod right here. And so for a perfectly horizontal force, torque is just simply equal to that perpendicular force times lever arm. And so if we want the sum of the torques to equal zero, we're just gonna factor in the torque from the 40 kilogram mass, the torque from the 10 kilogram mass, and then make sure it adds up to zero. And what we'll do is, you know, obviously we've already figured out that it's gonna be at the two meter point and we figured it out two different ways. Well, this is gonna be a third different way. And what we're gonna do is say, well, we don't know how far it is. So we're gonna ballpark it right there and just say that, hey, it's a distance X from the 40 kilogram mass, which means the distance from the 10 kilogram mass would be the rest, whatever the 10 minus X equals. That way the total distance between the two still adds up to a total of 10 meters. Okay, so if we look at the sum of the torques then, so we're gonna take force times lever arm, so, and we're gonna cheat though, as you'll see. So 40 kilograms times X, and then 10 kilograms times 10 minus X equals zero. Now you might be like, well, wait a minute, Chad, you said it's force times lever arm. These are masses, and you're right. To turn a mass into a force, though, into a weight, I'd have to multiply by 9.8 meters per second squared. And so if I multiply this by 9.8 and this by 9.8, well, the truth is then both terms would have a 9.8 in it and the other side's equal to zero and I could just divide 9.8 out of the equation. Well, if I can just divide it out to simplify the expression, then why put it in to begin with in this case? I'm just gonna leave it out. So you're right, these technically aren't forces, they're masses, but I'm effectively, I've already divided out the 9.8 meters per second squared out of the equation. All right, so if we go ahead and solve for this here, we're gonna get 40x, oh wow, one more thing, positive and negative. So it's customary for torques that lead to a rotation that is counterclockwise to be defined as positive. Just like as you go from quadrant one to quadrant two to quadrant three to quadrant four, going around a circle from zero to 360 degrees, that's positive. And then anything that's gonna cause a rotation in the uh, clockwise direction would be negative. That's customary. You could do it either way and the math works, but that's what's customary and that's what we're gonna stick with in this case. So with the 40 kilogram mass here weighing down this way, that's gonna want it to cause uh, rotation in the counterclockwise direction around that fulcrum we drew in right there. And so we're gonna make that positive. Whereas the 10 kilogram mass and its corresponding weight is gonna want cause rotation around that fulcrum to be in the clockwise direction and we'll make that negative. And so now we can do the math. So 40 times X is 40 X. So minus 10 times 10, so minus 100, and then negative times negative x is plus x equals zero, and 40x, oh, well, I jacked something right there, so plus 10x, my bad. So, and then we're gonna get, uh, where is it? 40x plus 10x is 50x. So we'll put the 100 to the other side by adding it in, equals 100, and x equals, once again, two meters. So another way to get this, and this might look like fairly long and drawn out, but again, uh, usually I'll kind of skip this part and uh, kind of reason out something right here and be like 40x equals 10 times 10 minus x. And I just move this to the other side to begin with. And I kind of put the counterclockwise torques on one side and the clockwise torques on the other side and then say, how's this going to work out? And you can really quickly come out with x equaling two meters in such a case. Cool, so for two point masses, you can use the center of mass equation. You can kind of use the lever rule. You can kind of use the sum of the torques adding up to zero. If you find one easier than any of those or faster in a particular case, great. But if you get a more complicated problem where you've got more than just two masses, you're probably just gonna be relying on this center of gravity equation anyways, as we'll see in the next example. So the next center of gravity problem we're gonna find very similar to the previous one. The numbers are all nearly identical with one major exception. Uh, we've added sig figs to all the terms. Uh, I want more than one sig fig in the answer, so I added more than one sig fig to all the numbers in this problem. All right, the other uh, key difference we'll see is in the question itself. So question says, what is the center of gravity for the following two masses attached to the ends of a rod of mass 50.0 kilograms whose mass is uniformly distributed? So now the last problem had the, the, the rod in the middle connecting the masses as being massless itself, or at least of an insignificant mass. Not the case in this problem. It's gonna weigh 50 kilograms, but they were nice enough to tell us that it was also uniformly distributed. When you have a nice symmetrical object like this straight rod here, 
So if, if the mass is uniformly distributed, it means you could actually treat it as being the equivalent of all the, ma all the mass concentrated to a single point right at the center. Now we did problems like this with like say gravity of a planet and we said, so having a big planet of a certain mass is the equivalent of having a point mass located at its center for the purpose of doing like gravitational calculations and stuff. Well, same thing here. We're gonna pretend that all the mass of that rod is concentrated right at its exact center, since we're told it's uniformly distributed, which would be right at the five meter mark. And so we're gonna treat this problem as if we've got a 50 kilogram point mass right at the center, and that the rest of the rod is once again massless. And again, the solution comes out the same, but the math, the math here is gonna be way easier if we just assume it's all concentrated at that single point. All right, so from here, we can go back to our center of gravity problem and just do the plug in and chug in. So X coordinate of center of gravity equals mass one, 40 kilograms, at location zero or position zero, plus now the 50 kilograms at a position of five meters, plus the 10 kilograms at a position of 10 meters, all over the sum of all the masses. So we've got the 40, kilograms plus the 50 kilograms plus the 10 kilograms and I chose the numbers to make the math work out nicely here and once again 40 times 0 is still 0. 50 times 5 is 250, 10 times 10 is 100, 250 plus 100 is 350 and then all over 40 plus 50 plus 10 which is 100 kilograms so 350 over 100 and the x-coordinate of our center of gravity is going to be 3.50 meters written with three sig figs to kind of match and stuff. So, and we've just kind of confirmed what we concluded earlier is that the center of gravity was going to be somewhere to the right of two, but left of five. So, and in this case, it's somewhere, so it turns out right exactly at the 3.5 meter mark. Cool, so with more than two point masses to worry about, or in this case, something treated as an additional point mass, the whole sum of the torques equaling zero, you could still use that. I don't know that it's really any easier than this. The lever rule's not super helpful at all. So that's really only effective with two. So really only some other ways to really work this in a practical sense when you're dealing with only two point masses in a simple system. If you have found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.